Thank you for joining this webinar about HPP Fundamentals, sponsored by Universal Pasteurization. This is the first in a series of webinars planned to advance the knowledge and adoption of HPP, an exciting food preservation technology using simple pressure of water. I am your host, Mark Fleck. I've been involved with the HPP community for over 16 years. Initially, I worked with many of the early adopters in an equipment sales role, introducing HPP's benefits to food producers, retailers, club stores, researchers, and others. I had the privilege of working closely with APC, American Pasteurization Company in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the first company who demonstrated the business model of third-party HPP. In 2012, my wife and I moved to Lincoln, Nebraska, where I joined Universal Pasteurization Team. Universal had purchased five of the largest HPP vessels available at the time. In an application development sales role, we grew Universal's HPP contracting business in Lincoln, and then also began expanding their outsourcing business to other parts of the country. Today, they have four HPP service centers strategically located near food production hubs around the country. Having moved back to Minnesota last year, I continue to consult with Universal and other companies interested in commercialization of the HPP technology. Just a little background on this webinar. In early October, Universal sponsored the first annual HPP Summit. The one and a half day session was held at UNL's new Food Innovation Center in Lincoln, Nebraska. Over 200 people gathered that day to learn, share, and network. We had a great time and received a lot of positive feedback. One of the requests from the HPP community was to make the summit content available to their colleagues and others who could not attend. Just on a housekeeping note, Towards the end of the webinar, there will be time for Q&A. Please submit your questions via the questions box located on the right side of your screen. Uh, let's get started. Let's talk about HPP processing and some of the basics about what is HPP, why should I consider using high pressure pasteurization or processing, how does HPP work, uh, who's using it now? Uh, there's a lot of companies that are already utilizing this technology. And how do I go about getting started if I'm interested in looking into this? So let's talk about what is HPP. HPP is a cold pasteurization. Some people refer to it as a non-thermal food preservation technology or process that inactivates the harmful bacteria and also food spoilage microorganisms. The beautiful thing about HPP is that the flavor, the vitamins, and the nutrients of a food are maintained. There are some special characteristics about HPP in that it does affect non-covalent bonds, and so there's some things that we can do with protein folding, unfolding, and gums and gels and so forth to improve the viscosity, the creaminess, and mouthfeel of a product. So why would people consider HPP as a food preservation technology? First, it can enhance one's food safety initiative by inactivating the pathogenic vegetative bacteria, such as Salmonella, and E. coli 0157H7, Listeria, Campylobacter, and in shellfish, Vibrio, and other viruses. One of the limitations of HPP is that we do not inactivate spores. So you have to take that into consideration in your product design. A second key point is that it significantly extends product shelf life. And by, it does that by killing the spoilage organism, most typically the fungi, the yeast, and mold. And the beautiful thing about that is that it increases the refrigerated product shelf life by typically 2x or more. There's other reasons, important reasons, why one would want to consider HPP. Protect your brand, not only from a producer standpoint, a retailer, 
quick service restaurant, grocery, uh, club store, etc. HPP is a real game-changing technology. Many new businesses have been created with HPP. Many companies have introduced new products using the HPP technology, and uh, many companies are now looking at offering cleaner label products responding to market demands. It's a method of differentiating, producing higher quality products than heat or chemical preservation methods. HPP retains that heat sensitive bioactive compounds in foods. There's also the trend in the marketplace of going towards lower sodium foods. And one can do that and reduce the sodium in your foods, but it also negatively impacts the shelf life of a product. By going to HPP, they can reduce the sodium in the foods and yet increase the product shelf life. In certain applications like seafood, particular oysters, it can also enhance production processes. You can, uh, in addition to killing the Vibrio vinificus, that is a concern in that product, it also shucks the oyster meat free from the shell. So in any oyster processor, one could reduce the labor content by at least 50%. Talk a little bit about how HPP works. The picture on the right hand side shows an end view of one of the HPP vessels. You'll see the white baskets or carrier where the product is loaded into. In this case, these are some 48 ounce salsa containers. And then the vessel itself uh, is there showing in the middle. And we'll talk about how all of that works. In most all applications, and other than a few seafood applications, you'll want to be in some airtight or hermetically sealed packages, and that might include bags, pouches, plastic bottles, chubs, trays, etc. The key is that the product needs to be airtight so that water cannot enter into the, into the package. But many of the existing packages that you're using today would work with HPP. A simple test would uh, verify that. Baskets are then inserted into the HPP vessel, and then the vessel enters the system and is sealed by plugs going into the vessel. And then potable water is pumped into the vessel, creating isostatic or equal pressure from all sides on the packages. The product is held at that water pressure for, uh, that may range anywhere from 45,000 to 87,000 PSI, 310 to 600 megapascal or somewhere between one to six minutes, depending on the HPP recipe. There's a network of research organizations and also the equipment manufacturers that have labs, micro labs, that can do product testing, both for shelf life testing and also microbial testing on your products to determine what the optimal parameters are for your particular product. Pressure is transmit it uniformly and instantaneously throughout the product. So this process is just as effective on the surface of a product as it is on the center of the product. The HPP pressure disrupts the microbial chemistry of the bacteria and spoilage organisms, and the organisms then die off. Here's a schematic produced by one of the two principal equipment manufacturers, Hyperbaric, shows the product loading, the pre-filling of the vessel with water, the pressurization of that water within the vessel, and then it's held for a period of time and the product is unloaded. The second animation is produced by Avira Technologies, the pioneer in HPP equipment. And I'll step through this showing how the product is loaded into the vessel. The vessel is loaded into the frame. The water is added to the vessel. And the pumps build that pressure of water. And that's held for a period of time. And then the pressure is released. And the product is exited of the frame and goes on down to pack off. And there we go. There's some additional processing notes that are important. One of the frequent questions is, 
is the product effective on different shapes and different volumes of products? And the answer is yes, it is. A four ounce package of product being HPP'd is just as effective as if you were HPPing a, a 15 pound whole muscle product. So the product volume shape and uh, is, is there's no limitations with HPP. The key is that at least one surface on the package has to have flexibility. When the product is inside the vessel and you build pressure, even if it were just a bottle of water, the product volume will be reduced by up to 15% during the process. Once the pressure is released, the volume springs back again. Your physics teachers didn't know about us. Uh, water is compressible at the pressures that we work at. So the key is that at least one surface on the package has to have the ability to accommodate that volume change during the HPP process. And having said that, it's a good idea to try to minimize the amount of air in a package. Yes, we can HPP packages that are map packages or that there is some air in, but it impacts the fill efficiency of the products in the baskets, carrier baskets. And it also can impact the cycle time because it takes us a little bit longer to compress all of that air. To give you a couple of examples, we have done some products where we get 600 pounds in a cycle. That product is vacuum packaged, fairly dense product. On the other hand, we've also HPP products where we can only get about 200 pounds in a cycle. And those products, lighter weight products, had a lot of air in the package, but you can see how that might impact the cost of the package or the product on those products that we do not get as good of fill efficiency. The other aspect is that the foods with higher water activity, HPP best, and so typically juices, ready to eat meats, dips, and so forth, will HPP all very well. And then you get into things like prosciutto ham or dried beef or applications where the water activity is less, the hold times may need to be increased to have comparable kill of the microorganisms with the technology. Applications that would not work well for HPP would be those with very low water activity, for instance, flowers, you know, dried products, those types of products are not good candidates for HPP. In addition, products that are more acidic, low pH foods, typically you can use at lower pressure and shorter hold times. And an example of that type of a product would be some fruit juices, for instance. Within the vessel during the HPP cycle, there is compression heating, or some people refer to it as adiabatic heating, that results in a temporary temperature increase of about three degrees C per 100 megapascal. So if we went up to 87K or 600 megapascal, we'd have about 18 degrees C temperature increase in the product during the process. Again, as the pressure is released, the temperature of the product drops right along with it again. So typically the product temperature going into the process and the product temperature coming out of the process are very nearly the same. Talk a little bit about the applications of HPP. Uh, it, there's many broad applications today. Early on, we started with ready to eat meats. We did seafood applications. We did avocado and guacamole. But today, there are so many applications ready to cook proteins, salsa, hummus, many different beverages, dressings and side dishes, ready meals. Um, it's an excellent tool for very fast marinating. Uh, raw pet food manufacturers are utilizing HPP to address concerns about their incoming ingredients. A concept in that application, a lot of times we'll be doing ingredients and HPP them, and then they'll reintroduce the products back into their manufacturing operation and produce those parts. Here's a few examples, and we'll talk about a lot of them as we go along here. Just a few examples, uh, Purdue with their shortcut products. Um, on the right-hand side, Hormel, their natural choice. Hormel was one of the early adopters of HPP, initially using it back in the early 2000, 2001 timeframe on some prosciutto ham products. Then they went on to use HPP for their food service line, their Bread Ready food service line. And then about 
seven or eight years ago now, they introduced the natural choice slice, sliced pro, uh, proteins in the deli that you might find in the, in the deli. In the back, there are a variety of fruit juices, Genesis juices. Uh, there's also bottles from Bolt House on their yogurt-based salad dressings. Um, there's just a lot of applications uh, for HPP across many different product categories. More recently, a lot of uh, applications, a lot of interest from the premium fruit, juice, and beverage market segments. And today you'll find literally hundreds of different products, fruit products, juice products, beverage products that are HPP. One interesting example of a application on avocados was in the upper left-hand corner there. HEB wanted to bring a convenience product to market, and they had us HPP uh, avocado. We took the pit out, packaged it, HPP that, and we took a product that typically had a very short shelf life, hours or days, to 25 to 30 day shelf life with HPP. And convenience item with a long shelf life without preservatives. So who are some of the other companies that have embraced this food technology? One of the great stories is about Garden Fresh Gourmet up in Michigan, a picture of Jack Aronson. When I met Jack, he was a small regional producer of salsa in the Detroit area, and he was interested in, in growing and expanding his business. And so he went over time, he looked at uh, using HPP to address shelf life issues as he took his local regional products over a national distribution market. He had received an order from Costco and uh, realized very quickly that he didn't have the shelf life sufficient to go through national distribution. So over the course of about 10 to 12 years, they've grown their business from just under 5 million in revenue to well over 100 million today. They initially started with using one of the HPP outsourcers, a company called APC there in Milwaukee. And as their business grew, they continued to, they purchased their first HPP system and then added additional in-house capacity as their business warranted. Today, they are the number one fresh salsa manufacturer in North America. There's many other companies that either have purchased HPP equipment or utilize the HPP outsourcing network available, and these cover a gamut of applications. On this particular slide, we're looking at a lot of protein products, ham, turkey, bacon, chubs. Uh, the poultry, ground poultry manufacturers have tapped into HPP to increase the food safety of the ground poultry chubs that are sold in, in the refrigerated case and through food service. The second uh, slide here, again, looking at many different companies. Astra Foods was uh, utilizing HPP for some frozen roast beef product for one of their customers, uh, Subway. And they convinced Subway to convert from a frozen roast beef product to a refrigerated. And they could do that using HPP. The HPP process extended the shelf life. But now they could go and offer that roast beef product as a refrigerated item rather than a frozen item. On the retail and club store side of things, many of the companies have gotten involved with HPP and understand how to come in and talk with them and help them understand how HPP can benefit their organizations. And principally, they are seeing from their market, from their consumers, an interest in cleaner label products, and HPP allows them to do that. It allows them to offer cleaner label products with long shelf life, and that impacts actually all the way through the chain of distribution from a producer. A longer shelf life, they're allowed, to, it gives them the flexibility of producing in larger quantities from a distribution standpoint instead of shipping 
uh, once, let's say once a week, they might be able to ship, you know, once every other week. So their distribution costs might come down. They might be able to ship in full truckloads. And from a standpoint of the product on the shelf, because of the longer shelf life, the retailers see a lot less shrink. The product moves off the shelf before it ever sees its uh, used by date. So a lot of the retailers now have identified HPP as a go-to technology for their products, their in-store brand products, as well as products that are sold by national companies. The uh, Bolt House yogurt-based dressing, that is a product where they utilize the improvements in mouthfeel due to HPP. And you'll see those on, on uh, retailer store shelves now. Fresh Rice Foods, the Holy Guacamole, they were one of the first companies utilizing HPP. And they took and just totally revolutionized the fresh guacamole business. Um, well, prior to Fresh Rice Foods, Holy Guacamole coming into the market, there were very few choices, and most of the choices had a lot of preservatives in it. Fresh Rice Foods started offering a refrigerate, a uh, HPP refrigerated guacamole product, and uh, that company has grown by leaps and bounds and uh, very, very successful util utilizing the technology. Uh, Good Foods Group and um, Sandwich Foods are a couple of examples of companies who have tapped into utilizing HPP for dips and for wet spoonable salads and side dishes and so forth. Um, Juice So Good here, a Minneapolis-based company, uses it for their beverages, for their premium beverages. They have also introduced cold-pressed coffee and uh, baby food options that are now available via HPP. And then companies like uh, Hope Hummus, uh, Hope Foods produce a hummus product out of um, Colorado. Here's an example of another company, um, Jack Aronson, with his Garden Fresh uh, Salsa Company, was uh, purchased by Campbell's Soup, or Campbell's Fresh as it's called now. And he has started another company called Great Fresh Products, and they've introduced a product, a ready, uh, fully cooked protein product chicken, I think, was the first one that came out. Um, but he has deter figured out a way of stuffing that product with cheese and other things and HPPing it so you have a fully cooked, ready-to-eat meat product that you can literally pull out of the bag and heat up and uh, make fresh, great-tasting burgers, um, which is a great concept for kids coming home from school, something to eat before dinner. So how do I go about getting started? One of the ways to do is to tap into the HPP outsourcing network that's, that's developing around the country. There are, I think, 30-some locations now that offer HPP tolling services. Um, a lot of times you'll want to get together and work with like UNL's Innovation Center, National Food Lab, Virginia Tech, Ohio State, the manufacturers of the equipment, to understand what you need from a standpoint of pressure, hold times to reach the goals that you have for your product. Do you want a cleaner labor product? What kind of shelf life do you need on your product? What other characteristics are you wanting from you know, the HPP process? These organizations have staff on board, have micro labs that can help you in determining what the optimal pressure and hold time are to reach your goals. The other option that many companies have taken is to actually purchase equipment, and uh, they'll bring that in, prepare their site, install it, start it up, debug it, and then they need to staff and maintain that equipment on house, in-house. And that's also a very effective way to get into the business. But keep in mind that HPP is a batch process, and it doesn't lend itself too well to a lot of conventional processing lines takes up space, it requires maintenance. Um, it is something that, like I said, doesn't fit well with a lot of people's thinking of how food is produced. So Universal and the other HPP outsourcers understand how, what that means in that HPP journey and 
many of these companies can offer additional pack off services. So you can produce, you can focus on producing your product and sending it on to one of the outsourcing companies. They could HPP it and then they may kit that product, they may label it, they may ink jet a use by date on it, uh, but then it could be shipped directly to distribution or to your customers from the HPP outsourcer. Some of the other reasons you might think about outsourcing, you could very quickly respond to changing markets and instead of having to invest the capital in bringing HPP in-house, typical systems will run anywhere from you know, one million for a very small, smaller system up to about three million for some of the larger uh, systems that are out there today. So tapping into the HPP outsourcing network allows you to utilize the benefits of HPP without tying up your capital. And then other companies, if they have purchased, you have purchased the HPP equipment, um, the HPP outsourcing network can serve as a backup to deal with situations where you may at peak times in your season that you need additional HPP capacity, or if for some reason the equipment has gone down, it would provide a backup, a redundancy to your in-house capability. So we have time for some questions and answers. Uh, let's see what we have here. There we go. Okay, uh, one of the questions here, does the temperature of the water affect, alter the effectiveness of HPP? For instance, if there are ice crystals on the meat product. Um, yeah, one of the things you have to keep in mind with HPP is it is not effective on frozen products. And so uh, it is important that the product is uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit or above for HPP to be effective. Temperature typically for ready to eat meat products and many ready to eat meat products are not, it's not a critical thing. Most of the HBP machines are run using processed water in the say 40 degrees to 50 degrees range. For doing uh, raw proteins or fresh proteins, temperature of the processed water is more important. And so in those applications, we yes, we do want to keep that processed water as cold as possible. With HPP and raw proteins, there is some denaturing of the protein that occurs. And so to minimize that, we can run it colder. And then we can also adjust pressure and hold time to accomplish what a customer needs to accomplish, but to try to minimize that denaturing or color change of a uh, fresh protein. Uh, another question that was asked is what are some ways where HPP could fail the product? There are some applications. Um, for instance, if you have a bone-in ham product during HPP, a product like that, the meat would compress, the bone would not. And so uh, you, you could run into a situation where the bone would pierce or protrude through the plastic package. There are techniques that we use to get around that. Bone guards are materials, films that are very flexible and stretchy. And uh, so those are some of the ways that uh, we can get around that. The, uh, let's see, what other questions we have here? A question that came up, can you HPP air inside my package? Yes. Um, what will, again, what will happen is it will compress the air and then compress the product. So just keep in mind that if you do have a product with some air in it, that uh, the package has to have some flexibility so that uh, it can accommodate that volume change during HPP. Another thing that we often need to talk with customers about is the shelf life. How can I obtain maximum shelf life? And you can do that. Uh, we can let's say we can increase your shelf life by two times or three times. That may not be good if your package isn't designed for that. So we often get into talking with customers about the types of package film that they're using, the kind of oxygen transmission rates, what kind of moisture vapor transmission rates being used. A lot of times we can take advantage of the benefits of the shelf life increase by going to fil films with barrier properties.
Okay. Looks like that concludes the questions that we have available right now. And let me move on to the last slide. The presentation will be available to everyone who registered today. Just look for the link via your email in the next couple of days, including in addition to the presentation, there will also be a Q&A document addressing many of the commonly asked questions about HPP. If you want to learn more about Universal, uh, welcome to go to their website and their social media pages. Thank you very much for your attention today.